And we're live. Thank you for coming back to visit us again, dear listener. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, I'm going to let our guest, Mr. J. Manfred White soul. I probably should ask you how to say that first, but can you tell us how to say your name and then uh, introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers? My name is Jay Manfred Weichsel. I was nowhere close. I didn't even get Manfred right. <laughs> uh, Weichsel is actually the German name for the Vistula River, which is in Poland. The Polish name for the river is Vistula. Uh, the German name for the river is Weichsel. Okay. Is that where your people are from? I guess. I don't know. I'm just thinking <laughs> working. <laughs> Whatever works. All right. And the next part of the introduction, dear listener, is how we found them. So uh, Manfred is another author that came to us through uh, Declan Finn, friend of the show. He reached out, tagged a bunch of people. And before I knew it, we were booking all through the, uh, the end of the year. So he has a lot of weird people on his Twitter, but I'm here for it. And now you are too. So before we get too deep into this, Manfred, the religion question. Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? I, I got to say Star Trek. Um, I grew up watching uh, the original series and the next generation. Uh, love them both. They're both very different shows, obviously, but uh, they're two of my favorites, and they both had a real uh, influence on me uh, growing up. Um, you know, Star Wars, I, I, I was kind of born, you know, grew up like in between the two movies. Like, I remember Star Wars mania when i was younger and then they were talking about like doing prequels and they never did and i kind of forgot about it and then you know the prequel came out and me and all my friends were extremely disappointed we didn't like it and i never really continued with it so it's kind of a blind spot for me but you know star trek i, I can say i've seen the uh, entire original series uh several times and uh you know the next generation i used to watch a lot too Okay. And because we're polytheistic here at the Blasters Relates podcast, uh, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, or The Wheel of Time? Oh, definitely Game of Thrones. So I only made it up to about season five, but that's further than I made it with the other two. So did you watch or read the books as well or no? No. I, I read like half of the first one. It was, it was, it was okay. Um, yeah. I'll read it someday, I'm sure. I, I have a deal with the audience that I will read Game of Thrones just as sort of uh, just as soon as George R. R. Martin finishes it. That's a pretty good deal, um, you know, <laughs> which right, means I'll probably never get a chance to read it. <laughs> right now, um, I'm kind of going back and forth between um, reading a collection of uh, famous fantastic mysteries, which are the old Muncie magazines, and The Birth of Tragedy by uh, Nietzsche. So uh, two completely different and related random books, and I'm kind of just going back and forth between one or the other, one and the other. Um, I'm almost done with uh, The Birth of Tragedy, so I'll probably be reading uh, famous fantastic mysteries for a while because I just started, and there's like 30 stories in here. Yeah, I've been uh, working my way through Marcus Aurelius's meditations, so that's sort of... Good. Sort of might go through when I need some deeply reading, something to think about. Yeah. Um, it's kind of important to like go back and forth. Like you can't only read serious stuff and you can't only read, uh, you know, fun stuff. But if you read both, I think you have a pretty good mix going on. Yeah, and I, I read history uh, manuscripts as well. And, you know, sometimes friends that I went to college with send me their their uh, dissertations and whatnot. So like I, I'm all over the place, much like you. But uh, we here at the Blasters and Blaze podcast like both the fantastical and the scientific. So what was your first love, sci-fi or fantasy? Uh, oh, I grew up reading sci-fi, definitely. Um, in fact, I remember when I discovered science fiction. Um, I, my parents, I was really little. I was maybe like probably eight or nine, and they brought me to an, a space museum. I don't remember which space museum. It was maybe in, in Washington, D.C. I don't know. Uh, but in the gift shop, there was all the there were all these uh, Heinlein juveniles, and you know I, I looked at them, and the covers attracted me, and I picked one up. It was it was probably it was either Starman Jones or How Spaceship Will Travel. It was it was probably Starman Jones. I uh, picked it up. I looked at the cover. I read the back. Uh, interested me. I, I 
had my parents buy it and I was kind of hooked on uh, Heimlein Juveniles for a while and then I got into uh, you know the rest of science fiction through that um, I, I started reading analog around that time um, you know the magazine um, so definitely uh, you know my first love was science fiction have spacesuit will travel is a classic and that's one of the classics I've read so you have excellent taste. I'm guessing that was your first memory of sci speculative fiction then, was that those stories? Yeah, absolutely. And then I saw, um, you know, Analog, I probably, at a supermarket checkout. I was probably just like at the supermarket with my parents and I saw it at the checkout and I picked it up and looked at it and you know, it was just like probably just a few cents then and they bought it So um, for me. So, you know, that, that's kind of how I got into, into science fiction. Um, I was really, really into it when I was younger, uh, you know, just uh, all, all of the old uh, visions of, of the future um, that definitely had a big uh, formative uh, impact on me, on me growing up. Um, I would write science fiction, but I, I, I'm having trouble imagining much of the future. So, uh, you know, I go to the past and I write fantasy and uh, I write some science fiction, but it's like science fiction that's set in the present, not the future. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So what is it about speculative fiction? So this will include both the fantasy and the and the uh, sci-fi, but what is it about the umbrella genre of spec fic that you enjoy? Hmm. Um, you know, I like that it, it kind of takes me out of the world where I am right now, and it also confronts me with a lot of ideas uh, that, uh, you know, maybe the world, my immediate world, wouldn't confront me with. Like, you know, I'm a kid growing up in suburbia in, uh, you know, the 80s and 90s, and, um, you know, the world doesn't really confront me with a lot of difficult questions or challenging ideas, but when I read those old books, uh, they did, and they kind of made me question um, the world around me and, and, and the ideas that, that everybody took for granted uh, in the world around me. So uh, that, that's what I really enjoyed. And, you know, that, that's, that's what I like about reading in general, not just uh, reading speculative fiction. Um, you know, Nietzsche does the same thing. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's really what, what I enjoy. And, you know, also the escapism of it. Um, you know, I like the, uh, you know, the whole, uh, you know, fantasy aspect and just, you know, visiting a, a different world. Okay. So how did your love of speculative fiction transition into you writing stories in that space? Um, you know, it took a while. Like, I'm, I guess, <clears throat> on, on the older side uh, of people who were, you know, just starting out writing. Probably not. I'm probably on the younger side, actually, now that I think about it. I don't know. I'm maybe right in between. But uh, I guess I started writing speculative fiction. I started writing short stories in um, 2016. Um, and I guess I talked about, you know, Heinlein and all that. I was also reading Edgar Rice Burroughs and Robert E. Howard when I was a kid. Um, I got into them a little bit later. I got into, you know, the old pulp when I was maybe 17, like around that age. Um, or I got into the science fiction when I was maybe like eight or nine around that age. Um, so I probably did it like a little bit opposite most people who maybe probably start with pulp and then get into hard science fiction. I started with hard science fiction and got into pulp. But, um, you know, I was reading pulp, um, you know, through my early teens and late 20s and, uh, you know, revisiting it occasionally throughout my life and revisiting hard sci-fi occasionally throughout my life too. So, you know, I really, I always wanted to write. And I always, like my whole life, I've, you know, gone, I've tried to write and it hasn't worked out. I stepped back from it and then I stepped up again, tried to write and step back without really finishing anything or really following through with anything. So, you know, around 2016, um, you know, I just sat down and, and I started writing and I saw that there were markets looking for you know, different kinds of stories. So I experimented writing different kinds of stories and my early ones were real failures. Um, you know, they're not published, they shouldn't be published. Um, and uh, they, they were just, you know, learning experiences. And then my 
first story sale was a story called The Funniest Story Ever Told, which was sold to a now defunct pulp magazine called Mill Havens. It's actually, it was reprinted um, by Fabula Argenta, which is an online blog. So you can actually find it uh, online if you search maybe my name, Like Soul, The Funniest Story Ever Told. I can even... Um, put a link in the chat so I can probably uh, Google it and find it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I can link that in the show notes. What's up? Yeah, we can link that in the show notes. Yeah, here, why don't I uh, just Google it right now? I hate doing this because I'm supposed to be talking, but uh, funny is story. So why, why so, are you doing uh, that? Here, go here. Ahead. Uh, like so. Okay, here we go. Okay, I got it. It's right here. Um, so I'll put this in the uh, chat right here for you. Okay. And um, so how did that, you know, story oh. lead to where you are today? Because this, this was your first one. Yeah. Obviously, you, you know, well, your first published one. Yeah. So how did you go from that story to deciding, you know what, I should keep doing this? Well, um, you know, selling a story uh, is a real huge uh, boost to your self-esteem. Um, you know, when you're a writer and you haven't sold anything and nobody's read anything of yours and you can't get people to read it, um, you know, that, that doesn't feel so good. But when you sell a story, you know, that's when you, when you really feel, um, you know, like you can do this. So my next story was to Kursova Magazine. Um, and that was, um, um, that was, that was, um, Going Native was my second published short story. And, um, you know, that really cemented me because Kursova, unlike Millhaven, is a magazine that people actually read and people <laughs> the story and they liked it and uh, they reviewed it and it got positive reviews and you know for the first time you know i saw what people liked in my story um and the thing that they really liked was the humor in it um that's what jumped out at everybody the humor and the satire now on top of the other reading I was talking about, I also uh, read a lot of old satire. Like, I love um, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman, um, Gulliver's Travels, Gargantua and Pantagruel, um, you know, all the Lucian, um, you know, all, all of those old uh, satirists. I just love that. And I always kind of saw myself or identified with that kind of, uh, you know, social critique and social commentary that, um, you know, <clears throat> they accomplished through their humor and the uh, critique of the human condition, the ridicule of the human condition uh, is something that, uh, you know, I've always identified with. And, you know, ridiculing the human condition, that, that sounds like a good, uh, you know, life mission for me. So I just kind of took that and I ran with it. And I started really developing myself as a satirist, um, which I think my theory about writing is that uh, you have to have a vision. And I think, <clears throat> you know, the problem with a lot of writing now and a lot of these scenes on, on you know, social media and whatever is that, you know, people kind of cling to this idea of what writing is supposed to look like rather than doing the work of forming their own vision. So I think what what, what I did and what writers should do is you, you form a vision of what do I want to write? What kind of books do I want to write? What are they going to look like? And you make sure that that vision is beyond what you're currently capable of doing, but something that you can work towards over time time because that gives you the room to gradually improve in your writing so you know set goals like this is what you want to accomplish with my writing and you know do everything that you have to do to accomplish it and your writing will, will slowly get better and better and better um, according to the parameters that, that you set out for it and you know I think with a lot of these uh, 
you know, people online like, oh, I want writing that looks like this or I want writing that looks like that. You know, people write towards that vision, which I guess is what an editor is supposed to do. It's what John W. Campbell did with uh, Analog. Um, and it's what uh, Frederick Poole did with uh, Galaxy. Um, you know, they laid out visions and writers followed those visions, you know, writing according to what the editors wanted. Um, but, you know, the difference today is that uh, a lot of these people aren't editors. They're just uh, kind of, you know, voices speaking out, out into the void. And so, you know, the, the work, uh, you know, unfortunately gets get scattered along with, with it. Okay. Um, and since we're talking about your work at the moment, could you give us the Reader's Digest version of your body of work, uh, aside from the ones you already mentioned? Right. So, you know, I've, I've, I've sold probably a dozen short stories. I also self-publish longer works. Um, so just like my earlier short stories were failures, um, you know, my earliest uh, self-published works were failures. Um, my first really good one was the uh, 2020, um, I guess, uh, revision, revised edition of Ibu Gogo. Um, so, uh, you know, that's that's for sale everywhere. That's for sale on Amazon, on Apple Books, Google Play, Smashwords. Um, it's uh, available in all of the, uh, you know, online bookstores uh, from Amazon to Barnes & Noble to, uh, you know, just all of them. Um, so Ibu Gogo is a uh, satire about um, two groups of cryptozoologists who are hunting, who are searching for these um, little diminutive uh, cryptids called Ibu Gogo. And the two groups of cryptozoologists are led by uh, ex-husband and wife, and they're competing with each other to find these Ibu Gogo. But the Ibu Gogo kidnap the wife's team, and <clears throat> the ex-husband finds himself in a position where he has to, uh, you know, save them. It's it's um, I'm probably not explaining it very well because it's like really filthy. Like it's just got like filthy revelation humor all over the place. Um, it's a uh, really and it's gory too, and and violent, and it's really funny and. Um, you know, it's, it's my most popular book, uh, for sure. And then after that, I did uh, Five Maidens on the Pentagram, which is a gothic horror sex farce. Um, that's one of my funniest books and uh, one of my most popular. Then I did uh, two extreme horror books with a lot of comedy in them. And then I did uh, Jungle Jitters, which is another jungle adventure uh, book, uh, which is about... Um, Ilya Ivan, uh, Ivanovich Ivanov, the uh, Soviet mad scientist who in the 1920s attempted to mate human beings and apes in order to create a hybrid creature. And uh, this book is about a cult in the present day that is descended from him and his ideas. And it's about three Hollywood ingenues, three starlets or wannabe starlets who find themselves trafficked to the Congo in order to uh, carry out these gruesome experiments. And that one's pretty funny too. And then, um, you know, I, I know I'm probably not doing a good job expressing the humor uh, in, in my books, but uh, you know, you just got to read them to see. Then I did, um, let's see, Not Far From Eden, which is a, um, it's a fantasy based on <clears throat> based on uh, the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees, the story about these angels who rebel against God in order to have sex with human women, and then they create the Nephilim, um, and uh, chaos ensues, and uh, the earth is flooded, and a lot of other crazy stuff happens too. And then I did my most recent one, which is um, the Caledonian Boar Hunt, which is based on the old Greek myth, the Caledonian Boar Hunt. Those all sound fascinating, and uh, we're not going to leave the audience in suspense on what we're talking about. If they're watching it, the cover's on the, the screen, but before we do that, so many authors let their own real life experiences influence the stories they tell. So were there any specific formidable moments you think that shaped you as a storyteller that, that chose to tell these types of stories? You know, I, I consider my stories to be very personal and, and there's something of me in all of them. 
Um, you know, what that is, is, is private probably. I probably shouldn't say, and I probably have to do a lot of work to really uh, dig it up and think about it. Some of it comes from my own, you know, unconscious, um, even, um, and other stuff just comes from like, you know, my, my biography. But uh, I think, <clears throat> you know, when I, you know, decades and decades and decades from now when I pass on and people start studying me and being interested and learning about my biography and who I actually am, you know, I think people are going to be very, very uh, surprised about how much in my life uh, comes out in my books. But the big one probably is the 10 years I spent in Hollywood. Um, like uh, my book, uh, She Was Asking For It, which is an extreme horror book, and, uh, you know, Jungle Jitters, which also uh, satirizes Hollywood. Uh, both of those take place in Hollywood, and both of those pull a lot from my experiences, uh, you know, in, in Los Angeles, um, you know, in ways that uh, probably people wouldn't believe if I just wrote it as a straight up uh, nonfiction book. They 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 accuse me of uh, of lying like that that guy uh, James Fry. <laughs> okay, uh, so obviously those all sounded fascinating and adding more and more books every time I turn around to the uh, to the to be read pile. <laughs> but uh, the Caledonian boar hunt, like you, you mentioned, the historic ties to the to the premise, but obviously you you took twists on that. So where did you come up with the premise and said, you know what, this story exists and I'd like to basically do my telling of it because it looks like you're almost doing fairy tale retellings with classic stories like that genre yeah that, that's what my last two books were uh not far from eden was a retelling of an ancient hebrew myth uh from the dead sea scrolls and uh, the caledonian boar hunt is a retelling of a classic greek myth um so the caledonian boar hunt um i was it actually i was uh it comes from los angeles too uh but probably like around 2012 I was at the Getty Museum in, in Los Angeles, and there's an old uh, painting of the Caledonian boar hunt. And it kind of jumped out at me, and I immediately became interested in, in the story. Now, I wasn't really a writer yet. I, I did go home and kind of read read up on the story, uh, you know, cracked open my, uh, my, my Ovid and, uh, you know, read uh, his version. Um, but, you know, I didn't write anything, and it kind of stuck with me for a long time. So, uh, you know, earlier this year, um, you know, February, I was, January, I was sitting down thinking, what do I want to write? And, you know, the real question was, where do I want to spend the next several months of my life? And I was thinking about it, and that place was, was Greek mythology, because, you know, I always enjoy Greek mythology, um, you know, I've read a bit, but I've never done, like, a really deep dive like I would need to do to adapt a classic Greek myth as a satire, um, as a, you know, just a short myth that's a couple paragraphs long as a, as a almost novel length, uh, you know, satirical novel. So, you know, I sat down and, you know, I just read and read and read and uh, learned all about uh, Atlanta, all about Meliager, all about Caledon, all about Artemis, um, all about, you uh, King Oenius and all the different characters and, um, you know, slowly put it together into, uh, you know, the, the book that, that we have here. Um, and that, that was great, just escaping into uh, the world of Greek myth. Um, that, that was really just a, a wonderful experience. Um, you know, all of my books are really heavy on research. Um, you know, I write satire. I, I don't know, um, you know, <clears throat> a lot of people don't know what satire is. Uh, so I'll just say what satire is. Uh, parody is when you make fun of fiction. Satire is when you make fun of reality. Um, but, you know, satire also has a connotation of, of being a little mean-spirited of ridiculing uh, human nature and human institutions and just individual humans. Um, so, uh, you know, that's really what I want to bring into my work, that, that kind of ridicule. So not only did I research, uh, you know, the old Greek mythology, but I tried to find parallels between, you know, the, the stories and some of what's happening in, in the world today and in, you know, uh, modern 
American or even world uh, society and, you know, figure out how I could, you know, use the story to comment on, you know, a lot, a lot of things that I wanted to comment on. And, and there were a lot of parallels. Uh, you'd be surprised. Um, you know, I'm reading, you know, the Caledonian boar hunt and, oh, the king locks down the kingdom. Hey, I was living in the middle of a lockdown. That, that, that's, an, and that's a parallel right there you know? So uh, that that's kind of how, how my process uh, writing it, um, you know, worked out. So we're looking at the cover. So before we dive in too deep to the story, so what is the story of the art you chose? Because it has some remnants of the style that you see in some of the classics, but it's obviously modern art take on it. The covers, colors do kind of pop. It creates that sort of scene you're going for. But mm -hmm. so what's the story of how you chose to portray this, uh, this cover and um, where you found the artist? Well, uh, Scott um, Doc Vaughn has been my cover artist for a lot of books. He was the cover artist on Ibu Gogo, Jungle Jitters, uh, Five Maidens on the Pentagram, Not Far From Eden, and The Caledonian Born Hunt. So he's, he's done five books for me so far, and he's terrific. He's absolutely great. Um, and so, uh, you know, I gave him a lot of old Greek art. I gave him statues of Atalanta. That's the woman on the right there. Um, I gave him uh, statues of Meliager. That's the guy with the spear um, in the back there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of, I, I, I wrote out like pages and pages describing what I wanted. Um, and, you know, he read it and, and he did it. But I knew that this was the scene that I wanted. Um, it's the scene that's uh, most commonly portrayed on all the carvings and all the paintings. Um, and, you know, th there are other scenes from the story that, that are popular in art too. Uh, Mel Yeager handing the pelt uh, on the board to Atlanta is also a popular subject in art. But uh, th this is the one that I wanted because um, I think it really expresses a lot of the, um, you know, excitement and, you know, the danger uh, uh, of, of the story. Um, you know, you got the guy being trampled there. Um, and I, I just, I, I think it's actually, it's, it's a really phenomenal, um, you know, uh, work of art, uh, the cover. So I'm really happy with it. Uh, I was impressed too. It, it really stuck out. Uh, before we dive deeper into the story itself, we're going to pause for a moment. Dear listener, you know that time where we shamelessly shill for the man. Well, hello, all you beautiful chicks and dudes of all sorts. This is Suave Rob Suarez, the bitchin' double X daredevil star of Suave Rob's amazing ass saving association, here with another ass saving tip, totally free from me to you to help you save your ass so you can live to sit another day. Now, back in the day when dudes were dudes, this one dude, Benchmark Bob, buddy of mine, he had this little accident. He tried frying up an egg when he was totally hammered. So he washed a pan, then didn't dry it, then put a shitload of butter in it, then turned on the heat. Well, when you do that, chicks and dudes, the water makes the oil go splatso all over your own personal face. And good old Benchmark got his bench marked, if you know what I mean. Like, when he took his apron away from his face, it looked less like a face and more like someone had stepped on a pepperoni pizza. I don't like to think about it. But that goes to show you, you know? Always dry your pans before you put oil in them, man. Especially if you're frying an egg. Want to know where I learned all this gonzo shit? I got it all done up pretty for you in Suave Rob's Double X Daring Do, the first book of Suave Rob's Awesome Adventures by J. Daniel Sawyer. Come share the awesomeness with me, my brothers, because you never know. The ass you save may be your own. All right, welcome back. Thank you for sticking with us through that commercial <laughs> interlude. And so we're back talking with uh, Manfred about the Caledonian boar hunt. So what would your 30 second elevator pitch for this novel be? 30 seconds. 
Oh no, it's over. Um, okay, so uh, the Caledonian boar hunt is a story about uh, the king uh, Oenius uh, gets drunk and fails to honor the goddess Artemis. As revenge, he sends a giant boar to terrorize the kingdom of Caledon. Uh, the boar, uh, you know, kills people. It destroys all the crops and all the vineyards. So uh, the king organizes a hunting party led by his son Meliager of all the greatest heroes in Greece uh, in order to go fight the boar. Um, but uh, I, I probably should have done a different elevator pitch. Um, but no, I'm doing well. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, most of it's about uh, actually in the field before the boar hunt. Um, see, what happens is uh, Atalanta, the huntress, arrives, and none of the other heroes, they, wanna, they don't want to hunt with a, with a woman. That would be uh, dishonorable uh, to them. So uh, there, most of the book is actually about them arguing about whether or not to hunt with a woman. That's not even true. Uh, that's really a small part of the book, but that's my favorite part of the book. I think it's, uh, um, so, ooh, ooh, wow. Um, can we do that again? Hello? Absolutely. You, you, you killed it. There's, there's no reason to redo it. You did good. Um, so what do you think makes your retelling of this classic story so special? Well, most uh, of the old tellings of the, the story are, are very fragmentary. Um, really, the only really, really, really complete version is Ovid, and you know that that's Roman, not Greek, and it's a very Roman uh, retelling uh, of the story. Um, while I uh, feel that uh, you know my retelling is a lot more Greek. Um, you know, there's there's themes like fate, like hubris, uh, like, you know, all, all of these, uh, you know, old Greek themes, uh, you know, pop up in the book. I'd say actually probably fate plays such a role in the book that it's almost the, the overriding theme of the book from the beginning to the end. Um, I also really explore the relationships between Meliager and his mother and Meliager and his wife and Meliager and Atlanta. And I kind of make a little bit of a almost kind of love triangle between uh, Meliager, Atlanta, and, and his wife. And uh, my, my characterization of Jason is just off the wall. Um, you know, I was writing Jason, and sometimes, like, if I'll write a character, I'll just, like, imagine, like, you know, like an actor, like in my head, like playing that character in order to help me get into it. And when I was writing Jason, I was thinking um, a very, very, very young uh, Andrew Dice Clay, uh, you know, playing the role of Jason. Um, so, uh, you know, Jason's just this like filthy mouth sailor um, because Jason is the first sailor. So I figured that Jason in real life would talk like a sailor and that's how I made him talk. Okay. That's an interesting um, author choice for, for your main character. But um, which tropes do you think the, uh, the Caledonian boar hunt hits the best? Well, you're retelling of it, so obviously that's going forward. All the questions are speaking of your version of it. But what tropes do you feel like this story hits the best? Well, that, that's that's actually a difficult one. I don't always think in terms of tropes. Like, I'm not above visiting TV tropes and seeing what I'll find. Um, I don't really think I, I did that um, here. Um, you know, what, what, what tropes? Um, I guess, um, you know, like, Atalanta is, like, kind of a woman, a huntress. Uh, she lives outside of uh, society. She lives in the Arcadian forest, which is like the really wild part of Greece. So she's kind of like that huntress, uh, wild woman trope, um, you know, like almost uh, Amazonian. Um, so th there's a trope. Um, and I guess the boar is really a monster. Um, it's 
probably one of the most famous monsters in Greek mythology, actually. So, uh, you okay. know, it breathes fire and stuff. Like, it's really crazy. So, uh, you know, that's a trope. Like, you know, the, the monster um, invades the village and, um, you know, starts killing people, and then the heroes have to kill the monster. Uh, you know, that's, I guess, like the, the Beowulf trope, if that's a trope. Um, I guess maybe, uh, do, 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 um, you know, Jason and Mel Yeager are foils for one another. Like, Mel Yeager is really like the nice boy, the nice guy, uh, who, in being a nice guy, is kind of sleazy, while Jason is like the, um, you know, the, the, the dirty mouth, like the, the jock. So you kind of have like, and they're both uh, competing with each other to, to kill the boar. So you have that kind of like nice guy versus a bad boy bad boy um kind of deal going and i guess that's that's a trope too um there, there's more there's probably a lot more um oh um you know a lot of it is uh you know in greek uh satire um there's i i don't remember the greek name but it means viewed from a mountaintop where um you know, a lot of Greek satire took real extreme experiment, real wild experiments in terms of point of view. And so like you could have a story where the point of view is like a character looking down from like Mount Olympus or a character looking from the mountaintop or, or a character watching like Earth from the moon or something. And so I did that a lot in the story with Artemis. Um, a lot of the book, um, instead of being from the point of view of the characters on the ground, and a lot of it is from their various point of view a lot of it is from the point of view of artemis the goddess watching everything from mount olympus and intervening when and where where she can in the action um so just that that kind of radical point of view i, I don't know if that's actually a trope because people have not really do that anymore but it was probably a trope to two thousand and something years ago like 2500 years ago uh, we'll take it. Uh, so obviously you've mentioned that this story, your retelling of it is a satire, but other than satire and just generic uh, historic fantasy mythology, are there any other genres that you might categorize this book for someone trying to figure out if it's for them? Well, um, you know, it's people who, who are interested in Greek mythology and who, or who even enjoy Greek mythology. I don't think you need any uh, prior uh, knowledge of Greek mythology to enjoy this book. Um, and I think that scares a lot of people off um, because uh, the Caledonian Boar Hunt, to be perfectly honest, I think it's my best book. It's my most recent. It's my funniest. It's very exciting. It's... Uh, as of this uh, podcast, not my, my best-selling book, uh, to be honest. Um, but I think it's a really entertaining book. And I think people who might be interested in Greek mythology who have never read any before could maybe jump into this book uh, because I do a lot to modernize it. Like, I, I, the entire book is written in, like, a very modern vernacular. Um, it's not written like, uh, you know, like in, like a like a 19th century romantic translation of, of a Greek uh, myth. It's, it's written in very, it's written in like street language, basically, very coarse, uh, you know, street language. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, people who enjoy more modern fiction could actually get into the Caledonian War Hunt. I think there's a little bit of horror in there. Like there's a monster, it kills people, you know, that that's, that's horror. So I think people who like a lot of gore in their stories, because there's a lot of gore in here, are going to like it. Um, I think there's a lot of action. You know, it's a story about a hunt. And when, when you're hunting with, um, you know, th this story takes place in the, in, in the Bronze Age. Um, it takes place 1300 BC. There's no, there's very little hard metal. Everyone's using, um, you know, soft metals and stone tools uh, to hunt the boar. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, it's really difficult. Like, you're using one of those old spears. It's not just about aiming. Like, throwing the, and hitting the boar, like, throwing, actually throwing the spear is hard. Um, and it takes a lot of physical effort. So people who are interested in that kind of like action-based, uh, you know, storytelling and, uh, you know, are also going to be interested. There, there's that kind of pulpy aspect to it. Uh, 
where the characters are using very old weapons and uh, you know t doing doing their best with them. Um, so I, I think you know people who like action are going to enjoy it, um, and of course people who like humor are going to enjoy it. But then you know it's it's fantasy and it gets very dark and so you know you could call it almost a, a dark fantasy. So I think people who enjoy fantasy and, and, and dark fantasy especially are going to get into it. So there you go. It's people who like humor, people who like action adventure, people who like fantasy, people who like dark fantasy. Uh, they're all going to dig this book. Okay. Um, so the elephant in the room, you spelled Caledonia slightly different than Spellcheck might say it was supposed to be spelled. So why did you spell it with a Y for C-A-L-Y for the Caledonian? I'm, I'm correct here. I did not put this song in the title of my book. Let me go look this up. Caledonia. So modern there's, spelling. There's a lot of different ways to put it, but uh, it's definitely spelled. I definitely spelled it correctly. Um, you know, the, the, the Greek, uh, I think you're, you're looking at uh, maybe a different word uh, because I just looked it up and I, I did not put a misspelling in the title of my book. I totally so if you look at Caledonia, it's spelled C-A-L-E-D-O-N-I-A-N. I don't know if that's the people, if that's separate, if that's an older spelling. I was just curious because... Well, you know, I mean, there's different ways to spell. Like you could spell it with a K instead of a C, like a lot of Greeks do that. And instead oh, okay. of Caledonia, and you can say like Caledonios. And, um, but, uh, you know, the, the Caledonian boar hunt is the uh, correct uh, spelling because Caledonia is a real place. You know, it's it's not like an imaginary. Um, right. And, and the reason I asked is because if you like well, Googled just, it. I just uh, gave you the Wikipedia page. for Yeah, no, I, I saw. Um, the reason I ask is because uh, the modern spell, some of the modern spelling spells it that way. And if someone was looking for your book, they have to know how to spell it to find you. So I thought if we if we right. mentioned it, they would go, oh, OK, let me fix my spelling so I can find it. Well, look, Caledonia. Oh, I guess so. Uh, Okay, there, no, Caledonia is a completely different place with an E. Uh, the Caledonia, I'm looking it up now. Um, uh, Caledonia with an E is uh, in Great Britain. Uh, Caledonia with a Y is on the island of Aetolia in Greece. Oh, okay, so we learn something new every day. All right, um, so uh, no, now no, I'll, no, I'll, I guess I'll take the opportunity to say, like, you know, I wanted to use the Greek names of all the characters. Like, uh, you know, this can be tricky because, you know, I'm reading different sources and not all of them are Greek. Like some of them are Roman. But, you know, you have to know that like, like Artemis is the Greek goddess. The Romans called her Diana. Okay. So, you know, you're reading a story with, and, you know, Heracles is the Greek name for the guy. Uh, the Roman name is Hercules. Uh, you know, they're, they're spelled and pronounced differently. So uh, I, I did try to use uh, the Greek names, um, you know, <clears throat> where I could, like with reason. Like some, and sometimes there's different ways to spell the Greek names in English because Greek is a different alphabet than English. So like, you know, Caledonia could be like, like with, with a K instead of a C. And, you know, that, that's fine because, uh, you know, it's, it's a different alphabet. It's, it's So, uh, you know, I, I tried to do a balance between using the Greek names and spelling them in ways that the pronunciation would be obvious to an English language uh, reader without having to, uh, you know, stop, stop and think about it. Nope. And uh, I'm, we learned something new, but either way, now they know how to spell it, they can look for you and find you and buy the book and give it a read. So okay. now let's talk about the story itself. So what can you tell us about your main character? Was it just one person you focused on as a main character or was it a cast of characters? Oh, uh, I never focus or I rarely focus on one person as the main character. Uh, most of my books are uh, ensemble uh, pieces. Uh, in this case, though, uh, the protagonist is uh, Mel Yeager. Um, he's a prince of Caledon and um, you know, he, his father set him to lead the boar hunt. Now, he just wanted to go out and hunt the boar himself because he's invulnerable. Uh, he can't be uh, injured or destroyed um, or hurt. Um, and his invulnerability plays a part in the story. Um, 
that that I tell. Um, but you know, he wants to go alone, but his dad, you know, won't let him because uh, you know Artemis. She wants to kill the king's line, all of his kids, and Meleager is one of his kids, so can't go alone. So they bring hunt, they bring great heroes from all over Greece. About half of those heroes that come <clears throat> are uh, former Argonauts who come with Jason and. Um, Jason, uh, you know, is real kind of possessive, uh, and he wants to take control of the boar hunt and lead it because he wants to be the one to kill the boar because whoever kills the boar wins the prize of the hunt, which is the uh, Tuscan hide of, of, of the boar. So, you know, he's kind of a rogue. Um, he does what he can to undermine Meleager's leadership, and they, they ruffle feathers a bit. But... Uh, you know, Mel Yeager. And Mel Yeager also falls in love with Atlanta on site. And, uh, you know, this isn't good because he's already married and his wife happens to be the sister of Idis, one of the Argonauts, and uh, I guess Idis's brother, uh, Lancaeus. Um, so, uh, you know, it causes a lot of drama. And like a lot of the book is about the uh, little interpersonal drama that goes on between the characters uh, dur during the course of Before the Hunt and, and the actual hunt itself. Okay. So were there any secondary characters in this story that were memorable to you that you focused on at all? Um, there are so many secondary characters in, in this book. Um, you know, there's a lot of characters. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the book, I, I just kind of name all of the characters, and then they pop up, um, you know, occasionally. There's some characters that only have just, like, one scene or, or a couple lines. Like, uh, Iphicles, uh, he gives, like, two short speeches. Uh, this is Heracles' twin brother. And uh, in the book, he kind of has this complex because his brother is this, you know, great hero, strongest person on earth. And he is just kind of, you know, just a normal guy. Uh, but he looks identical to his brother. So everybody always mistakes him for Heracles, uh, even though he's not. So he kind of has a chip on his shoulder about that. And that I liked. And uh, I give uh, Castor and Pollux, uh, Polydeuces, uh, a little cameo too. Um, I think probably my favorite cameo is um, Nestor. Um, he is known for his wisdom. Um, this book takes place a generation before the uh, Trojan War, and Nestor later, as an old man, dies during the, the Trojan War. But he's also at the Caledonian boar hunt. Um, so he, uh, you know, has a little, has a little, has a funny little scene where. Uh, uh, um, there's the three sons of Hippocuan, and the boar rushes one and gores him while Nestor jumps out of the way into a tree. And then the other two brothers kind of confront him about this. And they're like, why do you jump into the tree? The boar just ran past you and, uh, you know, killed, uh, you know, our brother. Uh, it should be you who's dead, not him. And he just answers, well, that's why I jumped. Um, so he, he has uh, some little uh, funny lines like that in a scene. Um, you know, th there's a lot lot of characters in here that have their own um, cameos. I, I probably like dozens, actually. I, I couldn't mention them all. Um, and, you know, some are pretty obscure. Um, like, for example, um, the uh, lion hunter, uh, Panopsis, um, there was no myth that uh, he was listed as a member of the Caledonian boar hunt. He's a famous lion, lion but other than just listing him as a member of the hunt, like he doesn't appear anywhere in any myth or story or poem except like, oh, he was there. So I looked at him and I read all about him and I found his epitaph. You know, an epitaph is like a little thing you write about, like, you know, the guy after he dies. And his epitaph tells like how he dies hunting. So I kind of took his epitaph and worked that story a little bit into the actual uh myth and uh, I, I was really happy how that turned out um and then there were other little stories like that too um like uh I, i'm getting um i'm probably getting a little too uh didactic here or uh, what's the word pen 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 or whatever the word is um i'm i'm enjoying it though so hopefully the audience is too but uh we all know dear listeners that i'm a little bit of a history nerd so this is well, this is right up my alley so 
Uh, does this story have a bad guy that your your main characters have to face off? Is it man versus nature? Is the bad guy just the boar? Or are there other interpersonal things that sort of serve as the bad guy? Obviously without spoilers. Well, the real villain is uh, Artemis, um, the goddess who sends the boar um, to kill the Caledonians because she's irrationally angry at uh, you know, Caledon for the king's failure to honor her at first harvest. Um, so she sends the boar, it terrorizes the kingdom for years and years and years. She does all this stuff. She uh, you know, tries to kill the king's kids just because she doesn't like the king. Um, and you know, she's also jealous because um, you know, I, I took the story of Aeneas and Dionysus and kind of weaved it into the into the myth. Um, you know, Dionysus teaches Aeneas how to make wine, and Aeneas becomes the first person in that part of the world to make wine. Um, but uh, the, what Aeneas does is he says, um, well, you know, Dionysus is visiting me. Uh, I'm so lucky. What kind of gift is he going to give me? Um, you know, I see, I see that he has the hots for my wife. So I'm going to just go on a little trip, pretend to honor Zeus, so that Dionysus uh, takes my wife and gives me a gift. And so he does, and Dionysus does, and Dionysus gives him the grape with instructions on how to turn it into wine. Uh, so I, I kind of weave that story in there, but you know, Artemis is like this, like hardcore, like feminist figure. So she sees this happen from Mount Olympus, and she's pretty pissed. She's not happy at all. So you know, she's not just angry at the king for failing to honor her. She's angry at the king for uh, you know dishonoring his wife. So she starts to watch Caledon like Caledon like really closely. And, uh, you know, pick out all of the different faults and flaws with the Caledonians until she builds, like, you know, this big case against them and just gets angrier and angrier and angrier. And then, you know, that's when she sends the boar to kill the Caledonians. Um, so the Caledonians, like, they're ostensibly, like, you know, hunting a boar, but really it's Artemis in the background pulling the strings of fate that, that are making everything happen. And even after all the Argonauts and the other heroes from all over Greece come, you know, she's still pulling the strings to try to make the hunt turn out the way she wants it to instead of the way they want it to. Um, so... Um, you know, really like, you know, the, 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 the villain on the ground is the boar, but it's, it's a little less, it's, it's not like, if it's just a monster, that's, that's not very much of an interesting story to me. Um, you know, just a monster that just wants to kill. It's, it's honestly a little, a little shallow. But there's, um, you know, also this whole drama going on in Mount Olympus with Artemis pulling the strings and, uh, you know, making stuff happen uh, without sometimes she intervenes directly, but more often than not, she's intervening indirectly. And that's what I think is is uh, really interesting about about the story. OK, um, so. Speaking of characters, since we've been talking about them, if the characters that you wrote in this story met you in a back alley, how badly is your day going to go after they knew sort of you reimagined their torment for them to live it just one more time? Oh, my goodness. Everybody in the book turns out bad except well i don't want to say who turns out well because that's a spoiler but uh nobody in the book comes out uh looking well um they would probably be beat the crap out of me um unfortunately. you know lucian uh he, he's a satirist um you know he has the story where he is where he's running an auction of all the different philosophers and the the people come up to buy a philosopher and the philosopher does what on twitter is called like explain your philosophy poorly and the person buys the philosopher like ridiculously cheaply to do um, menial labor and you know the message is that all the philosophers aren't worth anything so he wrote a sequel to it where he's just walking home down the street and all the philosophers who are satirized in his in, in the previous story, they come out and they beat the heck out of him. They're just pounding him and kicking him, and they're going to kill him. And so he calls on Truth to act as a judge uh, 
for him to see if like he portrayed them accurately. And at the end of the story, truth sides with uh, Lucian and, and not the philosophers. So perhaps uh, something like that would happen. Like the characters would come up, they'd be really mad at me for making them look all bad and uh, for, uh, you know, portraying them in over the in over the top comedic manner. And they'd, uh, you know, start beating me. But, you know, maybe I'd call them like, I don't know, the muse or uh, truth or, or somebody like that to act as my judge and defend me against uh, these characters because you know I really think I, I might have not portrayed them in a flattering way but I do think I portrayed them in a realistic and accurate way okay and since we're talking about um, oh, we already asked that one the um, so were there any cool scenes that you wrote in this story uh, that didn't make the final cut that you think would be kind of entertaining? Because this sounds like it's uh, a more exciting version of what they might have made us write, read as undergrads. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the book, I did try as hard as I could to make it exciting and something that, uh, you know, my readers who are, you know, modern readers in the modern age and are going to enjoy. Um, you know, it's 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 something where if you've never read Greek mythology, you can jump in, you can read the book, and I think you're you're going to have a lot of fun with it. Um, but there were a lot of stories because when I was researching the book, I was reading a lot of uh, you know Greek Greek mythology, and um, you know a lot of it. There's some really good stories there that uh, I wanted to put in, but they just didn't fit. Um, I guess one of them would be uh, the birth of Artemis. Um, you know, her mother was Leto, and um, Leto had had an affair with Zeus. Now, Zeus's wife, Hera, she wasn't happy about that. She's never happy when uh, Zeus has an affair and always tries to get revenge on, on the woman. So with Leto, um, she made all the monsters of Earth crawl out and chase Leto so that she couldn't give birth. Um, and so she's running all around the world with these two twins in her stomach, um, Artemis and Apollo, and she can't give birth anywhere. And finally, she finds like a little floating island, like some some seaweeds that are floating uh, at a floating island and she climbs onto the island and finally she's able to, to, to give birth and um, you know that that was a scene that, that I thought I could really write well and, and I did kind of sketch it out without really finishing it and I wanted to put it in the book but <clears throat> just didn't fit just uh, it was too much super uh, superfluous information, and uh, you know th there were a lot of stories like that where um, you know they're good stories, they were interesting stories, but uh, you know they, they they just was too much. Like you know a lot of um, the big uh, book about the Argonauts is the Argonautica of Rhodes, and it was not only you know reading that but reading commentary on it and you know one guy said like you know what what wrote what, what he did that was so great was knowing not only which myths to choose to put in there which ones to select but which of the old myths to leave out and you know that kind of sense that he had of what belonged where is what you know made made the book uh, you know so good. So you know I, I kind of read that. And I'm like, you know th that's right. Uh, you know the the book it's not going to be good because of what I choose. You know that's going to make the book great, but what I choose not to include is going to make the book too. Um, because you know I've got to be the one um, you know making choices when I'm working with old material of where I want to put the focus on and what I want to say with the material and what material I want to use to say that and what I want to exclude. So you know there's a whole lot where they're great stories and I would have loved to have written them, but they just didn't fit with the overall theme or with the story I was trying to tell or uh, you know, the way I wanted to portray the character or, you know, some other reason or, you know, so, you know, th those stories had to uh, wind up on, on the cutting room floor. Okay. So what can you tell us about the larger world where the story is happening? Is it just standard Greek history? Did you add anything to it? Um, well, the story takes place, uh, you know, 1300 BC, which is a very long time ago because it's uh, 2020 now, so that would have been um, 3,000 
200 and something years ago. Um, not exactly 1300 BC, but around that time. Um, so, you know, I, I thought back, like, you know, Jason has just uh, become the first sailor. Uh, before Jason, everybody was going everywhere in little logs that were dug out in from canoes that were dug out from logs. And Jason had Argo build the first boat, the Argonaut, which was able to carry 50 people. So I kind of thought back, like, you know, Jason's like a city guy, right? Like, he's like city. And so he's, he's from... Iolcus, or however you pronounce it, you know, big, big city. Well, I kind of portrayed Caledon as country, as, uh, you know, off the beaten path. So I thought, like, there's technology that has reached uh, the cities so far that hasn't reached the country yet because things traveled, like, a lot slower then. So, you know, one of the Argonauts has an axe when Caledon doesn't have hard metal yet. And uh, Atalanta has a bow and arrow, and she's the only person there with with the, with the bow and arrow. And uh, Castor and Polydeuces, they ride horses, while the Caledonians haven't discovered horseback riding yet. And so, you know, I did a lot of thought in terms of uh, the, the technology and, and, the, and how it would impact, uh, you know, the, the culture uh, way back then. And it's probably not entirely accurate, um, you know, but, you know, I also, I, I did what I did to serve, to serve the story um, more than anything else. So in terms of that, <clears throat> yeah, it also takes place in the backdrop of, you know, the voyage of the Argonauts, the quest to retrieve the Golden Fleece, because the Argonauts have just returned. Jason's all like, yeah, I'm a hero. I got the fleece. And, uh, you know, he's like the man. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, his chest is all puffed out. Um, you know, he's full of pride. Uh, you know, his ego is like through the roof. And he, ju he just thinks he's the, he's the boss. So, uh, you know, I, I also thought in, in terms of that and, and the voyage of the Argonauts. There's a lot there that I wanted to uh, work in. I wanted to work in, like, all the stuff going on in Iolcus with Medea. <clears throat> um, but, you know, that, that, that I, I just was, like, in a different city and I couldn't work it into the story here. And um, th there was other stuff that I wanted to work in, too, like... Um, Peleus, uh, the wrestler, uh, plays a really big role, and I really wanted him to wrestle Atalanta because there is a story where he wrestles her, but, you know, it, it just didn't fit in, and it takes place after this anyway. It takes place in uh, Iolcus um, after the, the hunt, uh, and so, you know, it, it would be like a sequel. If I wrote a sequel, I would uh, include uh, Atalanta wrestling Peleus, um, but... You know that there's no way to to fit it into the story that I wanted to tell. So that was my next question. Uh, this is obviously a standalone. Are, are there any plans that you could potentially carry the story over or tell more like it? <laughs> you know, all of my books so far have been standalones, um, and I want to write a sequel uh, of something. If I wrote a sequel. Like, I've got an idea for a sequel that ties together Ibu Gogo and Jungle Jitters. Those are my number one and number two pop most popular books. Both of them happen to have um, Hollywood ingenues who go into the jungle um, and uh, have adventures there. So it could kind of make sense for them to meet each other uh, somehow and have an adventure uh, of some sorts. Um, <clears throat> with the Caledonian Boar Hunt, I'd love to write, you know, I have an idea for a story like Jason and Medea and, uh, you know, telling, uh, you know, that story like around the Caledonian Boar Hunt. Um, <clears throat> you know, what's Medea doing in Iolcus while Jason is in Caledon? And, you know, what she's doing is murdering uh, Jason's archenemy um, in a, in a really horrific and bizarre way um but uh you know uh, this book would have to be like way 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 more popular uh for me to be able to justify uh, writing a sequel like ibu gogo and jungle jitters those are both there um you know the, the, those will both hit the points where uh, I, I can justify uh you know writing a sequel this one i really like it um, but, you know, I think just the whole Greek mythology thing, I think it's, it's a little daunting for a lot of people. Um, you know, a lot of people, they think like, well, I don't know anything about this. Do I need any kind of prior knowledge to understand the book? And, uh, you know, people are, are so busy right now. Um, you know, 
who has time to learn about uh, you know all this background of Greek mythology, just uh, you know read, read read a novel. But you know you don't really need to know it. I, I do that work for the reader. You know I think I do that job for you. And I think uh, you know if you if you're into Greek mythology, I think you're going to love it. I think you're going to find like a ton of uh, they call them today Easter eggs. Um, but uh, you know there's going to be a lot of little details in there that you're going to catch and that you're going to appreciate. And I think you're just going to dig uh, the way I portrayed all the characters and the way I, you know, brought them to life um, in a way that, you know, is true to the characters and also true to my own um, our artistic vision. So I think anybody who really loves Greek mythology is going to dig this book. But I think if, if you don't know anything about Greek mythology, uh, you know, give it a try, see what you think. Because I got a lot of great feedback from people who didn't know anything about Greek mythology, who read the book and who loved it just because they said it uh, spoke to them in a language that they can understand. And, um, you know, that's, I think, an important thing for fiction to do. So are there any other myths that you'd like to tackle? Because I could see your uh, take on, like, I don't know, um, Beowulf could be a fun, could, fun retelling for you. Are there any others you want to tackle? Yes. Um, you know, right now I got, I finished my, my most recent book. It's coming out in like two weeks. It's this weird science fiction story. It's like a short read. It's 1300, 13,000 words. I'm going to sell it for 99 cents. Um, it's called, oh, but you know what? It's already out because this is going to happen after the book comes out. So I can tell you what it's called. Um, the book is called Planet of the Wage Slaves. It's my most recent book. It just came out. Um, on September 9th. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to take a chance on me, uh, it's gonna, it's only 99 cents. Um, so, uh, and it's only 13,000 words. So, you know, you can check that out too. Um, but, you know, right now I'm thinking about what I want to write next. And, uh, you know, there's so many really weird Arthurian legends out there like you know that, that are almost could make like a really good like relationship comedy and i would call the book uh, camelot and you know i would i would have like you know arthur and guinevere and morgan le fay and all the weird love triangles and all the weird trysts and affairs that all the knights have and try to kind of weave them into like this this story about uh you know life in camelot you know from like a relate the a relationship comedy and sex farce uh, point of view. Uh, so, you know, that that's, that's actually what I really, really, really want to write. But uh, the businessman in me um, says, you know, write a sequel to Ibu Go Go and Jungle Jitters. Um, you know, tie those two books, your most popular books together and start like a jungle adventure series because, uh, you know, that's what sells the best. And, uh, you know, I, I do, I do enjoy writing the jungle adventures. Um, and, uh, I think they're probably some of my best work. They're definitely some of the most controversial work. Um, they're the things where, you know, like Ibu Gogo, Jungle Jitters, those, those are the books where people like either love them or hate them. Like Ibu Gogo, it does not have a single three-star reviewer rating on Amazon. It's all uh, four and five stars or one and two stars. Uh, there's not a single three-star on Amazon for Ibugogo. And, you know, that's because, like, it's a very divisive book. Um, you know, unfortunately, in today's, like, modern age where everything is averaged, uh, five stars and one star is averaged together makes three stars, which maybe makes the book look mediocre. But, you know, it's not. It's divisive. And I think that fiction and literature, I think literature should be divisive. Um, you know, it should be controversial. And, um, you know, I think that that's good. And I think that's one of the things that I'm really proud about is that nobody just liked Ibu Gogo. Um, people either loved it or they hated it. Um, there's no middle ground. And, um, you know, th that's that's what I always strive for. And I think Ibu Gogo is really the one, and maybe Jungle Jitters too, uh, where I really, um, you know, accomplish that. Um, so, you know, I, I do kind of want to want to continue those uh, and, and revisit those characters because it's been a while now since I, I wrote those two books. I've grown as an author and I've changed as an author. So, you know, I think I'm at a point where 
<clears throat> I can take those characters and say something new with them. Well, you know, I think if I was writing a series where I just wrote like one book and then another book and then another book, they'd all start to look the same because I wouldn't be growing as an artist. But, uh, you know, writing all this other stuff that I have, I think I'm in a place where I can go back there and say something new with it that's really going to surprise uh, people. And um, really, I think, uh, you know, delight my fans and, uh, you know, piss off my, my detractors. Um, at some point, <clears throat> I'll write Camelot. Maybe I'll do like the Jungle Adventure sequel and then I'll write Camelot as like a little break. Okay. Well, this interview is clearly winding down, but was there anything about the Caledonian boar hunt that we didn't ask that you wanted to tell us before we uh, wrap this up? Um, hmm, anything that you didn't ask, uh, I think you were really thorough. Um, you know, I just, uh, you know, I hope that, uh, people listening to this, uh, decide to check out the Caledonian boar hunt and, um, you know, give it a try. Cause it's, it's, it's a little different. Um, you know, might, you know, take you a couple pages to get into it, uh, and to get used to, uh, my style because, you know, I write it in a very, uh, you know, unusual conversational, uh, you know, style this one. Um, I, 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 all my books, I, 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 you know, have like an idea of where I want to go, what kind of style I want to write them in. And this one, like, I knew I wanted it to sound like, uh, you know, somebody like sitting there at a bar telling this crazy story. So I, I wrote it in a very conversational, very vernacular style uh, that might take a couple pages to get into. But once you do, I think, uh, you know, you're going to enjoy it. So I encourage you to check out the Caledonian Boar Hunt at the bookstore of your choice. Uh, it's available everywhere. It's available on, uh, you know, the ebook is wide. It's available on Amazon, Google Play, Apple Books, uh, Smashwords, uh, Kobo, uh, you name it. Uh, the paperback is also wide. It's available on Amazon and uh, <clears throat> most uh, bookstores that sell print on demand books or you carry it because I, I distribute it, uh, you know, you know, pretty wide, widely. So if you use like bookshop.org or, or another uh, service to find, you know, paperbacks, order them to a store near you and go pick them up. Um, you know, you can do that or you can order it to be delivered to your home from the store of your choice. Um, you know, I encourage people to, you know, shop at Amazon, but also shop, uh, you know, elsewhere if you choose to, because, you know, you can get books anywhere. Um, yeah, you, you don't need to just get them on Amazon. And I try to accommodate people who shop elsewhere uh, because I think it's important that my books be available to most, as widely as possible to the most number of people that they possibly can be. So, uh, you know, I hope that you check it out, give it a read, and, uh, you know, uh, get in touch. I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can shoot me a DM. You can join my mailing list uh, if you if you want to and uh, get get uh, updates, uh, you know, every month or so and when I have a new book out. Um, so, yeah, keep, keep in touch. Read the book. Tell me what you think. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I look forward to hearing from you. So before we let you go, uh, you did mention some of your stuff has a more risque theme to it. So for the Caledonian Boar Hunt, what age range would you say the book is appropriate for? Uh, adults. Um, the Caledonian yeah. Boar Hunt has a lot of gore and, um, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to give it away, but uh, <clears throat> it has a, a pretty, pretty shocking, uh, you know, scene, scene towards the end there. Um, you know, some people like they advertise the uh, sex in their books. I guess I do that too. Um, but, you know, this one, it's just too good i don't want to spoil it um and uh you know deprive you of, of the uh, shock of uh you know c coming to that scene uh, towards the end but uh you know it, it's for adults only it not only deals it doesn't just have uh you know sex in it but it also deals with, like you know sexual themes like you know the characters uh you know, thoughts and, uh, you know, hang ups and, uh, inhibitions and, uh, secret, uh, desires. Um, so, uh, you know, all that is in the book. So, uh, you know, it's not for children. No. Although I was reading Heinlein's adult books when I was a kid. So who knows? Okay. Um, 
So this is the part, dear listener, where I remind you to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right book. So so do your part. And uh, since he already told you where you can find him, I will uh, remind you gently that those links will be in the show notes. You can find us on our Twitter at twitter.com backslash sf underscore fantasy underscore show sierra foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show you can email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com again blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com you can find us on facebook where all the shenanigans happen at facebook.com backslash groups backslash a blasters and blades podcast again backslash groups backslash a blasters and blades podcast you can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades Again, anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tack blades, where you can support the show for as little as 99 cents a month. You can help keep the lights on, or you could support us more directly at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Handley. Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Handley, uh, where um, be sure to put in the comment section that it's for the podcast. And I promise I will keep my co host, Doc Seska and Nick Garber. Duly intoxicated, they will drink until their liver surrenders. But I wanted to thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For the aforementioned Woo! Nick Garber, Elvis says hello, and Doc Seska, this was J.R. Hanley. I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom.